Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I'll just start with some announcements. Um, by popular demand I've decided to teach the weight loss certification course live in March. Um, I think it makes for better filming if I teach it live before I put it on a video platform anyway and people always like being part of that first group where they get to ask me questions during the class and all that sort of thing. So if you are interested in taking the weight loss certification course, get in touch with us right away. We'll tell you what that involves and um, get you signed up for that. Uh, another thing, uh, we have a whole lot of other certification courses. Don't forget about our fabulous vaccine course, which some of you, many of you probably haven't taken yet. Food over medicine certification course, women's health certification course, all kinds of things to help you be better uh, if you're in the business of helping other people to improve their health. So uh, let's get right down to the topics today. I've chosen constipation as the first topic. Um, one major challenge in improving public health, I think, is that it has become normal to have symptoms of illness. And so I think one of the things that happens is people look around and they see all kinds of other people who are suffering from the same conditions that they are and say, well, you know, this must be normal and I maybe shouldn't take it so seriously. And that's certainly the case for constipation. You can watch television for a half hour and see what the common diseases are because you'll see ads for drugs to treat them. Watch TV for a half hour and you will see ads for laxatives for constipation, probiotics to help constipation, and even drugs to help with constipation. It's easy to see how people might think constipation is just one of those things everybody suffers from and um, not something to be worried about. Well, it is common, uh, about 15% of all adults suffer from chronic constipation and millions suffer from it occasionally. But according to a presentation delivered to the American College of Gastroenterology in 2015, chronically constipated people are at very, very high risk of some very serious diseases. Researchers led by Lauren Gerson, MD, looked at the records of over 12,000 adults between the ages of 18 and 50 who were treated for chronic constipation. They were matched with an equal number of controls who were not constipated. Constipated people had a significantly higher risk of several things. And I'm not, okay, so I'm not going to read all these numbers to you, but constipated people had a significantly higher risk of serious things. One that really struck me was over 600% higher risk of developing colorectal cancer, over 500% higher risk of developing diverticular disease, and um, over 500% increased risk of other forms of gastrointestinal cancer. Dr. Gerson stated that the associations weren't new. That was not what was surprising about this particular analysis, but that constipated patients um, had so much higher risk than what they thought before. And uh, she said that in light of this, that um, constipated patients, even if they don't have any red flag symptoms like gastrointestinal bleeding or anemia or weight loss, should all be uh, tested for more serious disease. Now, what I thought was interesting about this, I guess this doesn't surprise me anymore, but none of the notes of the meeting included recommendations to adopt a high fiber plant-based diet and drink 64 ounces of water every day. Instead, the researchers talked about the need to subject constipated patients to more tests, and this blew my mind, and to analyze the data for more clues as to the risks of remaining constipated. Why would we not take all that energy and invest it in teaching people how to not be constipated and they don't need drugs and laxatives. What we consistently see here and what the medical literature really shows is that uh, within a very short period of time after adopting a whole foods plant-based diet really high in fiber with a lot of water intake, people begin to have very regularly that moving experience uh, that they're looking for. So the idea that we need to do more research on, on the risks associated with staying constipated, this is just ludicrous and it goes to how much we squander research dollars in this country uh, looking at things and looking for uh, information that just doesn't benefit anybody. Okay, well speaking of things that don't benefit anybody, uh, orthopedic doctors use all kinds of imaging to identify joints, muscles, tendons, and bones that are damaged and often propose surgery to correct the abnormalities discovered through the imaging. The problem is that with few exceptions, the images don't really tell you very much. They're not reliable. People who say they're in pain don't have abnormalities, and people who are in pain are shown to have uh, no structural abnormalities. I mean, there is just very little relationship between pain and what shows up on an image. In one study, researchers scanned 991 people, some with and some without knee pain. 
Meniscal tears turned out to be just as common in the people who had no knee pain as the people who had knee pain. Another study showed that only 20 to 25 percent of people who have back pain have a herniated disc, and 60 percent of people who have no back pain have degenerative changes in their spine. A study at Cleveland Clinic involved MRI for patients who reported back or leg pain and showed that 13 percent of them had herniated discs. There was no relationship between pain and the images. Some people experienced pain after their herniated discs resolved without intervention. Other people said they felt better in spite of the fact that during the period of time that they were under observation, their disc uh, d disease actually got worse. A new study conducted by French researchers showed essentially the same results. The researchers looked at 207 healthy volunteers who had no symptoms um, and no pain in their joints, and they used ultrasound to look at 32 joints in the hand and the feet. And the purpose was to look at degenerative changes and in inflammation, synovial inflammation in the joints that are initially affected by rheumatoid arthritis. Almost all of the healthy people in this study had joint abnormalities with 182 or 88% having at least one. 52% had synovial effusion, which is actually water around the knee. That's when the synovial fluid gathers around the knee joint. 13% had synovial hypertrophy, which is a thickening of the membrane that lines the joint. 35% had, had both of those things. And this is in a group of people who said that they didn't have any joint pain at all. The authors wrote that more studies are needed in order to differentiate between normal and pathological findings in the joints. And what really is important here is that what is deemed pathological is subject to interpretation. In other words, if you, if you take healthy people and line them up and do enough imaging of joints and, and tendons and that sort of thing, you're going to find abnormalities. Whether or not this is something worth knowing is entirely different. Until the types of studies are conducted to show that a certain type of imaging or looking for particular things has some value, I think the important thing is we just have to warn people that uh, if they're experiencing pain, the images are not likely to tell them much unless, of course, there's always exceptions to the rule, unless, of course, you're dealing with an individual who has a broken bone. I mean, I totally understand getting images for that person who has to have um, actually necessary surgery, but for the, the average person who shows up in a doctor's office and says, my knee hurts, my ankle hurts, my hip hurts, or my back hurts, images are not particularly reliable. Many times, being overweight, being sedentary, eating an inflammatory diet, posture, and how the, tra the joints are tracking and functioning is likely to be the contributing cause. Um, surgery won't help with any of those things that I just mentioned. What really helps is the right type of exercise, the right type of physical therapy, the right type of diet, and weight loss. So anyway, just be careful. I have friends who are orthopedic surgeons who... Um, who say that the vast majority of the time what people need is not surgery. They need to pay attention to their diet, lifestyle, and weight loss. So that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you on Thursday with more news.